We're going to find out what cup of coffee he's on and what the mug is this morning. Nico Moreno. Nico, good morning, my buddy. What's going on, John? SDH family. It is uh, cup number two, Rave Green Mug. No game last week. Play Colorado this week. So, you know, we're starting the week off nice and slow here. As you, well, I mean, we got to, we got to, you know, boost it up a little bit and let everybody know the energy that's coming out, out uh, this morning from out there. Uh, I was talking about uh, Tom Bogert had released yesterday that it appears as one of the roster uh, adjustments that is being proposed and it probably is going to get signed in the summer. It looks like the U22 initiative and the DPs, they will no longer be married. They will have a divorce and they can live on their own in their own homes in their own subdivisions. You won't have to worry about locking down your number of DPs to satisfy U22 numbers. It looks like starting next year, or at least this summer, you might be able to have three each. It's about, you know, ish time that this happened. Yeah, so I'm not 100% sure if it is going to get done this year in the summer window. I think it's a baby step to a lot of changes that are going to come up. You get it, though. I think we all do. The league wants to go younger. The league has seen the the benefits and how important it is to be this showcase for young talent. And a lot of teams are already doing these types of moves, right? In Miami, had a whole bunch. Uh, Seattle this season had their first uh, young DP. Um, you know, here and there, you, you've been seeing some of that. And that's why I understand why this could be the easiest thing to do and the easiest thing to just give those that have been screaming from the top of their lungs to just give teams, you know, just more tools, more resources, more ability to just get better, bigger rosters. You saw some of the issues that... And, and I don't want to be, you know, so simplistic to say that that's the only problem. But, you know, when MLS teams face this MX teams, there is a little bit of a there's a big difference when it comes to the salary uh, of the teams and such. So doing something like this just provides teams with just more talent. So I, I like it. I think it's a good initiative, but I'm not completely sold on if it's going to happen this summer or if they're going to just hold it. and put it together in a big old package for 2025, but, but we'll see. And, and that's the the thing that, you know, we've been talking about a lot. We talk about it here on the show. You and I have talked about it, uh, you know, forever and ever until we're blue in the face, or in your case, I guess, rave green in the face. <laughs> and and it, it's, you need to make these kinds of adjustments so your league can compete or be closer to competing with the, the Liga MX sides, because I know that there was a lot that was made of this week where the major league soccer teams, they were taken out back and, and the, the Liga MX sides got out the big leather belt and, and uh, decided to make a statement with the backsides of the, the major league soccer opponents in the CONCACAF champions cup and the hemispheric extravaganza. And I know it's like, you, you've got to release the shackles. You've got to, you've got to move the salary cap up all these kinds of things. I know it was only like an 8% increase from year to year. It's there. There are a lot of things that need to be done when it comes to increasing salary structure and, and availabilities and all these kinds of things. It's a great first step uncoupling these two, but it's a step of something that needs to have a lot of other steps attached to it. Yeah, it's a step in the right direction. And that's exactly why I'm not sure if maybe they want to start off with this, kind of like a little Costco sampler and just, here you go, guys, tell me how it tastes this summer. And then we'll give you the whole thing on aisle, whatever, uh, in, in 2025. Or are they going to hold it? But... Yes, at the end of the day, I think you'll see a lot of things going simpler and maybe we get rid of a lot of the TAM and GAM. And, and you know, I know that that's been in people's minds and conversations. Uh, I don't, again, I, I am an advocate for keeping the, the salary cap space because of all of the reasons that I've always mentioned in the past. 
keeps the league extremely balanced, competitive in all levels, and it provides the necessity for a lot of these teams to play their homegrowns and use those resources to create a pipeline to provide young players a way into the first team and a way to be contributors and a way to move on to other things. But you do things like this to just create a bigger purse for teams to get out of and and, and build their roster. So uh, I don't expect that to go away ever, in in my opinion, the salary cap, uh, but I just do expect it to get bigger and have things like this just make it easier for the bigger clubs to get talent and the smaller clubs to maybe go find gems here and there everywhere in the world, South America, Europe, whatever you might have your scouting things at. So I think it's positive. I know that some folks wear bracelets that have a WWJD on it, but if we applied what we're talking about to Major League Soccer and to your part of the world, the bracelet could just as easily sit there and say WWSD. What would the Sounders do? Would the Sounders continue to, let's say that, uh, this initiative that Tom Bogert reports happens. You uh, you decouple, the, you get the divorce of the U22s and the DPs, and you can get three of each, and you can do whatever. Would Seattle continue their current path of developing through Tacoma and finding the strategic pickup where you're going to drop eight figures on a transfer fee? Would they alter their strategy any if you get the idea of, okay, we can use all three DPs and chase all three U22s at the same time, would there be a seismic change or would it just be like, okay, cool, we got more stuff we can play with? I think it's uh, option B. It's just more we can work with, more of what we can continue to do what we've been doing because you have seen a trend change here in the uh, Pacific Northwest, if you will, Um, both whether it's the Timbers or the Sounders, and specifically talking about the Rave Green, you know, it started with Leo Chu, uh, a player that was not as high profile, not as a big of a budget, but it was a younger player, U22 initiative. And then you get your young DP in Pedro de la Vega, and you could see that that's the trend that they want to go to. Because just because I get young players and prospects from wherever it is that I might grab them, doesn't mean that I'm going to forget about my pipeline and my academy and and my homegrown players, because it really is a marriage. And there is a set of balance. And I feel like right now, there's a bit of a disbalance with this roster where because of injuries and everything that's going on, you have a lot more younger homegrown players than maybe you even would like to have on your bench. Uh, But this is just always going to be the Seattle way. So that's never going to go away at all. But now you might have more resources to go out there and get guys because they've been looking at younger guys. I mean, Pedro was one of five of that exact same profile, age, style that they were looking at. And I know that there is a bunch, included a nine, that is, you know, could be considered a, a young DP or, or or whatever you might be, under 22 um, as well. Uh, so, Yes, I think that's just the way the Seattle Sounders are going to continue to work because they have been wanting to get younger. They have been wanting to go out there and find themselves their Tiago Amara or their Alan Velasco. I mean, it is something that every club wants to do, and now you have more tools to do so. Last week, Mother Nature gave Seattle an off week. I know that we talked about you were not all that optimistic about a trip to Philadelphia. But uh, nothing happened. You got five minutes in. You got the the rain enough to buy 40 cubits of wood for Noah to build his ark. You get on the ark two by two, and everybody comes back safe. And Philadelphia goes and gets thumped by Pachuca. Uh, When you look at what happened last week outside of what didn't happen with Seattle, what stuck in your mind with the results from the last weekend? Uh, I mean, it continues to uh, be surprising to see certain teams, right? I mean... Uh, I don't want to keep banging, you know, that Toronto drums, but, you know, no goals uh, given in in three games. There is this beautiful marriage between John and uh, and Insignia, and uh, that seems to be working. And the group and all the drama that we saw last season has completely gone away. And you got to applaud that. When when you come into – 
a, a fire and you turn it all off and you're able to just get the team on the field as a cohesive unit and forget about what happened the, the previous season and you win games. Hasn't been brilliant, hasn't been amazing, but you're, you're earning points, you're getting this team to buy what you're selling. To me, that's always got to be credit to the coach. And uh, as much as I didn't think he was going to make this kind of impact, he has. And they've played some quality teams. It hasn't been, you know, like bottom feeders in MLS. I mean, he's played some some difficult, difficult teams. And and yet uh, this Toronto team just seems to be doing it well. So uh, that was interesting. Portland in the same, the exact same boat. I have here and every other show admitted that I'm not a Phil Neville guy. I didn't think that there was going to be a, a huge change in terms of the strategist and the motivator, uh, but he has motivated. I mean, you know, strategy wise, I, I still think that, you know, the DC game, I think he gives it up. He goes back to his five uh, line, five man back line, and he kind of allows DC to get on that game. Uh, that ends up in a draw, uh, but in this one against New York, you're 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 on the road. You go down a score, and still, you are able to motivate and put your guys in the position to, with, without without a lot of possession, be very effective. You could tell the guys as well buying on what he's given. You could tell in the sidelines everything he's yelling and everything that he's uh, trying to put out the guys are buying in on and in a very similar way there in Toronto it's been impressive that he's been able to do that with this group a younger group that has had some changes Anthony has been amazing Evander obviously beautiful goal um so yeah so that, that's basically what stuck around it just those surprise teams that maybe I wasn't so hot so high on and now they're doing well but we'll see what happens with Timbers I, I heard a rumor in the hallways about maybe Vander uh, leaving or so. So uh, John Raw has kind of put it out on um, Soccer Bar last week. So we'll see. Cause that, that'd be shocking if Vander goes because he's been a quality player. He's a guy that does a lot for the Timbers. Uh, but, yeah, that's kind of what stuck around. You've got uh, LAFC, a goal is draw with Sporting Kansas City. Tim Milia was uh, on his head. Vancouver beat San Jose 2-0. Colorado continues to win. 2-1 winners, all caps in Austin, a 2-2 draw. Minnesota 1-3-2 over the purple team. We've got the purple team here in Orlando. That's a tough one, man. Orlando has been a disappointment, man. I had these guys winning the Congregate Cup. They're already gone. Uh, I thought they were going to go to a hot start because they had, you know, a core group. They were going to be playing well. They have some new talent. They added the right pieces. They added experience. They, add, you know, they kept McGuire that – was kind of like a bonus because you thought he was going to be gone and you're still struggling the way you are, man. That's been kind of scary. Uh, I don't want to doubt Oscar Pereja, but, uh, I mean, it, it can get away from him if you continue to not pull it together. Look, Minnesota, they're, they're, they're no peach. Look, I, I get that they have some talent and Pookie has been good and, and Bongi came back and scored and, and, you know, you're still waiting for Reynoso. But, you know, this team has been kind of thriving on just – individual moments and Orlando's always been a team that's known for what being organized being a group making it difficult and just the amount of goals they've given up <laughs> in three games is unreal so uh that, that's been disappointing to see from Orlando and uh you know coming off of a a travel in the midweek where you get thumped by Tigris now you're having to come and you're going to be playing here against a rival on the weekend that put four on New England. And, and we called that right here, man. I want to say, I, I didn't go back to check because I had I, I had a difficult time downloading into my phone this time around the, the show, but I wanted to just check because you seemed like I did pretty well last week, man, and including that, uh, you know, I said, Atlanta United, they were going to come in, they were going to score some goals, and, and they did, man. Uh, and you're right. That's a, that's a good game coming up. That's tough for Orlando against uh, Jokomakis that just had a fantastic game. Yep, and so uh, you're going to end up with that one. So now it's time where we play cliffhanger and get everybody ready for what's going on this week. And with, with the matches, obviously, Purple Team's going to be a part of it with the discussion with Atlanta. You've got uh, afternoon games on 
uh, on Saturday. And the way that we traditionally do this, for those who are not familiar with how we do things here, we take the cliffhanger rules from The Price is Right. We go through all the games on the board. We get Nico's thoughts. If he's got a game he wants to talk about, he yells stop, or he just starts talking about the game in particular. And then that way we wrap things up for and get another week with him. So Chicago and Montreal. Chicago is favored 2 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time to start things off uh, on your Saturday. D.C. United and Messi and friends, and the numbers have exploded ever since Tata came out with the announcement last night that Messi probably is not going to play after he got pulled for 50 minutes, after 50 minutes in CONCACAF hemispheric extravaganza where they had a big lead, no worries or anything like that. D.C. United at home now is a plus 110 as uh, Inter Inter Miami comes to town now at a plus 214. Mm. We saw what happened last week with uh, Montreal winning in South Florida, and now they travel to D.C. D.C. is a heavy favorite. Still on the plus side, uh, hosting Messi and friends. Seattle and Colorado. I have to stop here because of local interest. Seattle's a minus 175 on the board. Colorado to win north of plus 480. What do you think? Wow, those are really the numbers, huh? Woo. Uh, look, man, I might be, I might buy into a, a Seattle win against Colorado. Seattle's still missing some guys, yes. But you're going to get Albert at least on the bench. Yammer Gomez and Dryden might start. That's your best defender. Colorado hasn't been impressive. I, I don't care what anyone says. That RSL game was a little bit odd. Uh, I felt like Arango was not his quality self in front of goal. Uh, I still don't buy on the, the pressing and what we're used to see from a Chris Armas team that, you know, has certain principles that you're not quite seeing right now. Uh, I heard from some fans that this was Jordy's best game. I, I had to go back and rewatch it because I didn't quite see that. So uh, I think that they're going to give the Seattle Sounders the ball. Seattle's going to get extremely comfortable. I don't think that they have the weapons to completely just bunker down and let's see what happens. We're going to play off the counter uh, to really hurt Seattle. So I think this could be a 1-0 game, a feel-good game for Seattle at home. Sunny is going to be 70 and beautiful, 1230. Um, I, I'm starting to see a little bit more from that offense with Raul Rediaz. They're going to go back to the 4-4-2 on this one. I think they can give Colorado some problems. Again, I, I think that a lot of people are shooting a little bit high when it comes to this Colorado team, considering what we saw in the first couple of games. Yes. Has there been progression? Absolutely. Has it gotten a little better? Yes. But at the end of the day, this team lacks a little bit of a, a bump, a, a hit. Some, some power uh, up top. Uh, Navarro has been uh, so-so. And if you can't really have a guy that's going to make Seattle uncomfortable back there, I think he's going to be a lot like Austin where maybe Seattle just needs to put it away. And that might be the difficult part because it's been their Achilles heel. But I see Seattle winning this game. Uh, I think that they're motivated. I think they need a win. Uh, as much as Brian didn't want to admit it, not playing a game still – allow certain guys to get back. You don't have that wear and tear of a game. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Seattle has all of the components and the situation to win this game against Colorado. Crew now on night side East Coast time. Crew hosting Red Bulls at a minus 109. We'll get to see what Emil Forsberg can do on the road at the Death Star at lower.com. Should be an interesting matchup trying to confine him for a full 90 minutes. Yeah, good one. NYC hosting Toronto. NYC, big favorite at home at a minus 137. Toronto is north of plus 345, almost a plus 350 to win at uh, at the locale in New York City, where wherever this match is going to be played. Uh, Give me Toronto, man. Give me Toronto, and uh, the alarms are going to go off in New York, and people are going to lose their minds. But I, I think Toronto's hard to break down. New York hasn't been able to break down teams. They haven't been able to score. I think if there's a team that's going to make you pay the fact that you don't have a creative player and you don't have some of those edgy, uh, you know, wingers that are going to stretch out your defense, it's Toronto, man. Shane O'Neill has been great. Uh, I talk about David Flores. I mean, the, the whole 
defensive uh, compactness that they have is going to make it hard for New York, man. I could see that being a 1-0 thriller and, and Toronto taking that away. What What's the numbers on that again? You got New York City at a minus 137 at Yankee Stadium. Your draw is a plus 295, so it's basically heading toward plus 300. And Toronto to win a plus 346 in the composite. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, no, I'll take that. I'll take that. Okay. Uh, 8.30 Eastern, Austin at Q2 hosting Philadelphia. They say this one's a, a pretty much a draw across the board. Both teams on the win and in and around plus 160 to 165. FC Dallas favored at home against Vancouver to plus 122. No surprise there. Houston at Hell in a Shell is a minus 109 hosting Portland, who's a plus 287 on the road. Minnesota wow. and LAFC at Allianz. LAFC's favored on the road at a plus 142. Minnesota United a plus 175. That's an intriguing number set up right there heading into that one. Yeah. Uh, what's the draw on that one? Plus 261 in the composite. Mm. I, I see a little bit of a draw th- there. I, I don't think Minnesota is going to uh, play as openly as, as maybe they have. Um, I, I think that they're going to be selective on their press. Uh, LAFC had had issues of their own putting the ball away uh, as much as they create opportunities and and they have great wide play. Um, this could be one of those draws. I love Martinez. Did you see Martinez last week with that run from coast to coast? He just obviously he's a young kid should have passed that ball, but he just did uh, a talent there. Uh, but no, I think this is going to be a draw. Uh, I'm not set. I'm not buying Minnesota stock. This Make that very clear. I'm not. Uh, I told you guys they're going to be that team that's going to make you cringe all season long. Yep. They're going to be on that line between getting to the playoffs and not into the playoffs, but I'm just not buying it quite yet. But I think that they could get a draw here against LAFC. Nashville favored against Charlotte at a plus 139. Sporting at a minus 137. San Jose has no offense. I got to go sporting there. LAG in all caps, the late game Saturday night. At a minus 127, Paintsville Peck and Pooge. It's a P3 up against all caps. I got to go with LAG. Mm-hmm. Sunday, it is the Revs and FC Cincinnati. Revs favored at a plus 122. Wrapping up 7 o'clock Sunday night, Atlanta and the Purple Team. Atlanta's a minus 115 with the Purple Team coming on the road. We talked about that one. You're leaning toward Atlanta, yeah? I, I think Atlanta is going to – Put it on Orlando. Uh, I'm not going to say it's going to be the exact same way as against the Revs, but uh, when you look at uh, Cesar Araujo being out, uh, I think that's a tough, sensitive injury for them in that midfield. You saw uh, uh, Martins come in, and it, it just wasn't the same with Felipe right next to Cartagena. Uh, I think I haven't seen Pedro Galese had a worse week or a couple of games Ooh. than he has just recently. Yeah. I mean, from the, the MLS game where he literally gave up the ball uh, at his feet to the game against Tigres where he's out of position consistently, where he's just not looking like himself. Uh, even his reaction off of mid-range shots has not been it. So I think Orlando's in, Orlando's in a bit of a slump. Uh, even offensively, Facundo Torres has not been able to ignite this team. Nicolas Odero himself, without the experience and everything that's going on there, it still hasn't been able to really put his mark. Uh, I think Orlando is in some issues in Atlanta. On the other side, they're coming off a very good game. They have the inertia. They have the momentum. Uh, I think it's going to be a good game for Atlanta. Looking forward to it. What's going on with Soccer Bar and Pulso Sports? All right, with Pulso Sports, we have everything that has to do with the injuries in the Seattle Sounders. We're going to have updates. Uh, Brian's much is going to talk back on Friday, so I would say check Pulso Sports then to figure out exactly who's going to be in, who's going to be out. If you're asking me right now, I think Stefan Fry's out, I think Joe Paulo's out, and I think Yamar and Albert are going to be playing off the bench. Maybe Yamar, he's looked pretty good. Maybe he gets a start, but he's going to have to shake some rust off. Uh, so you're going to get all that update, all of those uh, analysis, if you will, uh, in Pulse of Sports. Also, obviously, after the game, we're going to be doing our, my new segment, which is after the final whistle. Uh, I'll talk to 
whoever is available there at the press conference that is of interest of you guys. Maybe it's Jackson Phelps, maybe it's Pete Fewen, maybe Brad Evans. Whoever gives me the time to break down what happened in that Colorado game, they will be on Pulcho Sports and Soccer Bar in about an hour. We're going to break down exactly what we talked about here. We're going to go more in depth into the 6-0 from Pachuca, the 4-2 loss for Orlando, what's going on with Orlando, what's going on with Galassi. Check that out at Soccer Bar. What he said. Looking forward to it, my friend. We will catch up next week. Be safe, and may Mother Nature be kind so you have a game to watch and talk about. Appreciate it, my friend.